And good morning, everyone. How are you doing? Great. This is another debate. We've had eight since the great debate. If you uh, check your program book for those marked debate, uh, the great debate was the first one yesterday morning. We've had uh, seven since then. This is number eight. We have three more today. And I'll actually be chairing the final debate of the day, which does involve Mark Skousen, Anarchy versus Limited Government. This one is, has competition been oversold? And that's kind of a confusing thesis for a lot of you out there. It might, might not uh, be self-evident, because who do you mean? Who's overselling it? Is the media overselling competition, the left wing, the right wing, the uh, economics textbooks? Who is overselling? But the idea came from Peter Thiel's book, Zero to One, in which he says capitalism and competition are opposites. That's a unique theory. It might take some uh, serious explanation. I understand it now that I've read it. I didn't understand it before, but I grew up in Seattle where Boeing was the only uh, horse in town, the only big company. But after I left Seattle for college, up sprang Microsoft, Amazon.com, Starbucks, Macaw Cellular for a while. Uh, Nordstrom's is unique in its way. UPS was founded in Seattle by a couple of bicyclists in 1907. So these are the kind of ideas, the zero to one ideas that uh, Peter Thiel is talking about in his book. We have uh, plenty of copies of both books in the bookstore and the uh, authors will be signing these books after this debate. Check your program schedule, it's right at nine o'clock when they'll be signing. So the debate format has been the same for every debate, a 10 minute statement in the affirmative for the argument, followed by a 10-minute rebuttal in the negative, which will be delivered by John Mackey, and then five minutes for each speaker to rebut the uh, opening statements. And then in the last 15 minutes or so, we'll have questions from the audience, and uh, hopefully by then we'll have a microphone in the middle, and uh, you'll be able to line up for questions for the authors. So the question before the House is, competition oversold in America for the affirmative, please welcome the author of Zero to One, Peter Thiel. Well, uh, that's uh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, there, there's a lot uh, to say on this topic, but the uh, but basic starting point uh, that's very critical is to try to define competition properly. And I, I want to uh, suggest uh, that the way to think of competition is that that's what happens when people uh, try to get the same thing. So you have competition in politics when you have different people trying to get to be president. You have competition in sports when people are trying to get the same Olympic medal. You have competition in education when people are trying to take the same tests that the uh, educational system has, um, makes them take. Um, and that's when you get very, very intense uh, competition. We have a little bit of a competition here today with, uh, with me and um, um, uh, and John, and, and, and we always, you always, it's always overrated because uh, it's always oversold. I des it's even oversold to me. I desperately want to win this debate. Um, even though, um, and, the, it's all, and there is something about competition that's always prestigious, there's status, it's exciting, uh, but it is, uh, it is oversold, it is overrated because uh, it is, um, for starters, not that significant economically. Um, and uh, if you, want to make money, um, you, competition is not the way to go. Uh, so uh, in business, I've often said capitalism and competition are antonyms. Um, a world of perfect competition is a world where all the profits are competed away. If you want to start a business where you have to compete like crazy, you should open a restaurant. You will never make any money doing so. It is a terrible, terrible idea for a business. Um, um, if you want to succeed in business as a founder, early investor, early employee, uh, as an entrepreneur, uh, you always aim for monopoly. Um, and, that is, and we can have a debate about when that's good or bad for society as a whole, but on the inside, you always want to have monopoly. You want to be doing something that's so different, that's so good, that's so terrific, that nobody else in the world um, is able to do it. And we're, we're talking here not about government-backed monopolies, which are bad, like the post office or things like this. We're talking about innovative monopolies where you do something new. When, when, when Apple, when Steve Jobs built, uh, created the iPhone, um, he, was, it was, he was the only person in the world that had a smartphone that worked. And this was not creating scarcity. 
It was creating a new form of plenty. Uh, and that's what uh, good monopolies do. Um, and it was rewarded. Uh, he was rewarded for that by uh, building, um, in, you know, uh, within a, about a decade, the single company with by far the largest market capitalization in the world. And so this is, uh, uh, so I think this is always a really critical idea uh, in business. Um, now, when we, um, now there are many different contexts where, uh, where this, uh, this competition around monopoly uh, comes up and gets, uh, gets to be, uh, the, the, the comp the, this, this idea of competition creeps in. And I, I want to suggest that uh, we often have this idea that, uh, that our free market system is the place that's the most competitive, but that actually the places that are the most competitive are the places that are not free. If you live in a communist society, you have intense competition because you're not allowed to do all, all sorts of things, and therefore you have to compete incredibly intensely for the small number of things. There's competition where you have to get in a long bread line, and you have to compete with the other people to, uh, to get bread. Um, you have intense competition for the jobs in the Communist Party. If you're in a place like North Korea, you have to compete like crazy to clap with the people around you. And if you don't clap uh, vigorously enough, you may get shot. Um, you would, uh, all of you here today do not have to compete quite as much, which is fortunate. Um, you're living in a free, uh, free society where you do not have to do that. And I think that, uh, I think that um, uh, in a similar way, uh, we find it in sort of athletic competitions, academic ones. When Henry Kissinger said uh, that the battles in academia are so ferocious because the stakes are so small, he was not... He was not just talking, you know, it sounds like insane. Why, why would you compete like crazy when the stakes are small? Um, and that, you know, maybe it's just the people at Harvard are, uh, the fellow professors at Harvard are systematically crazy people. But, um, but they are doing it because, um, because whenever the stakes get small, the differences get small, and the competition becomes uh, more and more ferocious. And what, what we need to find a way is a way to do, do very, very different kinds of things. Um, in, in all sorts of contexts. And freedom, um, I think, consists of the ability not to compete and the freedom to do things that other people are not doing in, uh, in different contexts. And, uh, and you know, you're, you're certainly in the US, you are free to compete, but you're also free not to compete. And it's worth contrasting the benefits of those two. Um, I, I, will not, I will acknowledge that if you compete, you get better at that which you're competing on. You know, when I, was in, when I was in high school, I was a competitive chess player. I became, you know, very good at chess. Um, but, uh, but it always comes at this price of not doing other things um, and, uh, and narrowly improving the things you're competing on. It was very hard to get to be a world-class chess player because there were people in the Soviet Union who were uh, much, much better because the government had not allowed them to do anything else, and so they had to compete even more intensely at, at, at chess than, uh, than anyone in the US, uh, US really did. Um, and, um, and so in, in business, there are all sorts of contexts where this happens. It happens in academia, in uh, society. You know, I, 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 was, I was super tracked as a kid. I, I was junior high school. One of my friends said, I know you're going to get into Stanford in eighth grade. And four years later, I got into Stanford. I got into Stanford Law School. You sort of win one competition after another. You end up at a big law firm in Manhattan. From the outside, it's a place where everybody wants to get in. On the inside, it's a place where everybody wants to get out. Um, when, 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 you, uh, when, when I left after seven months and three days, one of the people down the hall from me said, wow, this is really reassuring to see that it's possible to escape from Alcatraz. And actually, it wasn't that hard. You just had to go out the front door and not come back. But, um, but, um, but psychologically, it was hard because so much of our identity gets wrapped up in the competitions that we win, and our identity gets wrapped up in beating the people around us. And, um, and that's why I want to suggest uh, that uh, the, um, the antithesis, the antonym of competition, is not capitalism or something like that, because you know, a capitalist is someone who's in the business of accumulating capital, a world of perfect competition, the capital gets competed away. The, the opposite of competition, I want to suggest, is individualism. It's being able to do things where you're not uh, always the same, where you're not always pushed to be the same as the people around you, and where you're able to actually think for yourself, do things that are a little bit different. There's a strange phenomenon in Silicon Valley where many of the most successful companies seem to be led by people who are suffering from mild forms of Asperger's. And this is a somewhat disturbing fact because it reminds us of the extraordinary social pressures we have in our society to compete, to become the same, 
and uh, where those of us who are not suffering from Asperger's are often talked out of our interesting, original, creative, different ideas before they're even fully formed, because we pick up on all these subtle social cues from the people around us, oh, that's a little bit too different, that's too weird, shouldn't go with that, uh, one way or the other. And we need to, um, we need to always uh, realize that there are these intense political, social, cultural, cultural pressures to compete, and it's when we overcome them that we do new things. So competition does make you better at chess or at uh, sports, or the politicians who um, uh, compete for public office get better at lying and uh, making promises. So it, you do get better at the thing you're competing on, but it always comes at this terribly high price of losing sight of this much broader perspective. And I, and I think fundamentally, um, competition would make sense, by the way, it would make sense in a world in which there was nothing new to be ever invented or created, where all the goods were static. Because in that world, every monopoly would be bad. Every monopolist would be like a troll at a bridge collecting a toll, like the post office, like our government monopolies. But in a dynamic world where you create new things, monopolies are good because they are the reward you get for innovating, for doing something dynamic, for creating something new. And I believe we live in a world in which there are enormous numbers of new things to do, and so if we channel ourselves into narrow competition like I did in my 20s when I uh, was brainwashed into uh, working in a, in a large law firm, um, or, um, or all these other relatively sterile forms of competition, we, are, we end up uh, losing out not just for ourselves in having lives that are more un, relatively undifferentiated uh, and relatively uh, less, uh, less uh, productive, but it's also our society ends up losing out because it progresses less, it becomes more homogenous, more the same, it becomes ferociously competitive, but in ways that uh, move the ball uh, less forward. And I think, I think there's a microcosm we see of this in all the debates around education where it has become strangely more and more and more tracked over time, um, and uh, it's become less and less productive. Uh, you know, people are paying more for the same. It's this super intense competition to get into the same colleges. They're all undifferentiated. Everyone learns more or less the same thing. Uh, at the top schools, people end up going into the same sorts of careers. Um, and uh, and it is, it, it, at some point, not, uh, not a good way to do things. And we all sense that the sort of educational bubble, which is a comp, uh, comp competition bubble uh, that's driven uh, by uh, people are being pushed to compete in narrow, unnatural channels is about to break and, is, and hopefully the future will be one in which uh, people will be doing many different kinds of things. Um, so I think that, uh, I, th I think, you know, even though there's an economic critique of competition and a business critique, at the end of the day, I want to sort of stress the, the cultural one that uh, we should put individualism over sameness uh, and that uh, um, don't compete, competition is for losers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Peter. Peter. Could we move this chair over here so I can stand by the... Yeah, thank you very much. And you notice I did not take a, a vote of the audience from the beginning because I thought the argument needed explication before you could intelligently vote. What a concept, huh? So we're going to have the, uh, the two people uh, put their positions forth and then vote at the end and who, who you thought won. Now, both of these books, as I said, are going to be signed afterwards. They're both excellent guides for business strategy, inspiring. And this book in particular isolates the heroic spirit of business. It is a very inspirational read for anyone in, in business. You're doing the right thing by being in business in America. Uh, John Mackey even says some kind things about his competitors in the outer stakeholder chapter about how he's excited when competitors come up with something new and something better and something different. So here representing the opposite point of view on our debate question, John Mackey. <laughs> Uh, before I get started, I want to tell you that um, I really do admire Peter Thiel. Uh, I think he's a brilliant man. I think his book is really good. I, I thought it was the best business book I read in 2014. And Peter's clearly an entrepreneur. He thinks entrepreneurial. And he has many provocative ideas in the book. So high, high recommendation for the book. That being said, I disagree. I disagree with what he says about competition and what he says about monopoly. So let me tell you why. First, we gotta start with the definition of monopoly. And exclusive ownership through legal privilege, command of supply, or concerted action, exclusive possession or control, and a commodity controlled by one party. 
So we should keep that in the back of our minds as we move, so move forward here. Now, here's the main problem with the way Peter uses monopoly. Monopoly is pejorative. Monopoly is what the enemies of business and capitalism accuse it of. And once they can accuse it of this, then they have the excuse they need to intervene, regulate, and control businesses. And capitalism is seen as a system that produces monopolies that requires the government to break them up and intervene. In view of the fact that business has this terrible reputation, I just think it's foolish to give the enemies of business and capitalism another weapon to use against us. Uh, we should, so we should be very careful about the language that we use and not to throw around terms like monopoly so that the, the, the critics and the intellectuals and the enemies can say, see, Peter Thiel says that businesses like Google, businesses like Apple are monopolies because that gives them just the excuse they want and need. Instead, I think when Peter's talking about monopoly in his book, he really means what is often said in business uh, uh, jargon as competitive advantage. Every business needs competitive advantages. And a definition of competitive advantage, a superiority gained by an organization when it can provide the same value as its competitors but at a lower price, or can charge higher prices by providing greater value through innovation and differentiation. I think Peter confuses monopoly with having strong competitive advantages. And what he's arguing for is that for business to be successful, it needs competitive advantages. And with that, I completely agree. Now, these are the characteristics he identifies in his book, or what I'll call the characteristics of a teal monopoly. Proprietary technology, network effects, economies of scale, and branding. Now, economies of scale and branding are common. I mean, <laughs> branding? Come on, every business has a brand. That's not, necessarily, it's not even necessarily a competitive advantage. Uh, economies of scale are, are not that difficult to achieve these days. Network effects and proprietary technology are a little bit tricky. But those don't necessarily lead to monopoly, but they are definite, important competitive advantages that businesses strive to achieve. So what he calls creative monopolies, and he argues that they're good for society because they innovate and they create what didn't exist before, such as an iPhone. But what he's really arguing for is what Schumpeter said is the argument for the creative destruction, the creative destructive power of capitalism. This doesn't come from monopolies. It comes from the very dynamic nature of competition. So-called creative monopolies are usually just companies with strong competitive advantages that will be eroded over time. No competitive advantages are eternal. When I was a, when I was a boy, I remember the big arguments around the dinner table in my house were about General Motors. This is a big, giant company. They have a monopoly on automobiles, and the government's got to break them up. Well, General Motors went bankrupt, and now the government does control it, but not because they were too big, but because ultimately they got complacent and lazy, which happens oftentimes when you achieve a dominant market position. Then it was IBM was the boogeyman. Oh, IBM's so big, something's got to be done about those guys. Then I listened to Microsoft, the terrible things about Bill Gates being dragged by the Department of Justice into the courtroom. Probably Bill Gates quitting business. He decided it would be better to be a philanthropist and have everybody love me than to be accused of this horrible monopolist and have everybody hate him. So that was probably good for his own peace of mind, but I'd argue it was pro and it was, you know, certainly he's done great things at the Gates Foundation, but what, is, what has Microsoft done since Bill Gates retired? We were much better off when Bill Gates was in there leading Microsoft. His favorite example uh, in the book is, is Google. Is Google a monopoly? And the argument for it is they have about a 75% share of the search market. So it looks like they have a monopoly on search. I mean, really, do they have a monopoly? Um, is there, 
can anybody compete against Google? Did Google have a monopoly 15 years ago? I mean, they created proprietary technology, and everyone that goes to Google, like myself, does so because I want to, because they're creating value for me, because it doesn't cost me anything to use Google. It's free, it's fast, it's effective, and it's a good thing because it's based on voluntary exchange. It's not based on coercive power of government that's keeping, keeping entrants out or forcing people to use the service. Google, one minute. One minute. <laughs> I got five minutes in the rebuttal. So I would argue that Google's not a monopoly, and furthermore, monopolies don't really work very well. Here you can see what true monopolies are. They're always the monopolies are the ones that government creates. The public school system, <laughs> government-controlled health care, nationalized oil and steel companies, and government-owned airlines. None of these are very effective. None of these work very well. So we'll just leave my slides up here, and I'll take, I'll take it up okay. in my five-minute rebuttal. Very good. And I'll be more careful with the chess so clock down here now. Down so I can you don't distract the audience while I speak. Uh, can you take the slides down, but be ready to put them right back up where they are? The yeah, you wizard, don't want to have an arguing the slide. <laughs> These guys have a monopoly, they have a monopoly on these on slides. They have a monopoly on the presentation, absolutely. Okay, they're up there, but not back there. All right. So um, a, lot of different, uh, a lot of different points here. I, 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 wanna, um, I do think that language is very important that we use. And, uh, and monopoly is a somewhat provocative uh, term, but it is to get our thinking out of, uh, out of all these notions of competition. And it's very different from something change? like competitive yeah. advantage, because competitive advantage, you are still taking your bearings from what other people are doing. Um, and this is, uh, this, is always, uh, um, this always is a much narrower form of competition. It's not how we really get breakthroughs, how we really uh, end up doing new things as a society. I think that uh, I think one of the things that uh, that John um, uh, that John uh, st uh, stressed here is that uh, is that when you have um, when you have these different uh, um, there's there's it, one of the things that's worth underscoring is you know I think Whole Foods but I think Google's a monopoly I think Whole Foods is a monopoly they have an un unbelievably strong brand you guys have you, you guys have uh, you guys have um, economies of scale um, it's um, and you know, I think John, you did a fantastic job. You were a very talented person. You picked an industry to go in where there were very few talented people to go into. That's actually a, an important <laughs> fundamental choice you make at the beginning of your life. Um, and so, um, by my definition, um, um, you know, uh, Google is an incredible monopoly. You don't want to go up against them ever. Um, uh, you don't really want to go up against Whole Foods either. It's it's a pretty tough monopoly as well, and that's why it's it's such a valuable business. Now, um, now the politically correct, my, one of my rules is always that whenever something's politically incorrect, we should always assume it has a little bit more truth to it than uh, people think. Because politically incorrect things are things you cannot articulate. And, um, and you know, John's in a very awkward position. You cannot be the CEO of any company in the United States and say, we are a great business because we're a monopoly. Um, you're not allowed to do that. It's against the law. We have antitrust laws that are enforced very arbitrarily and very randomly because every great company has monopoly-like elements. But uh, if you're somebody who went on, on stage and said, this is what we're actually doing, you will get in very serious trouble. And so I'm not saying that John doesn't believe anything that he said. This is not an ad hominem <laughs> point. Um, I think we should be aware of the sort of social and political context in which we're operating. And, and the kind of thing that John said is the sort of thing that every CEO of a Fortune 500 company in the US has to say. If you were the CEO of Google um, and you went on stage and said, we have profit margins that are higher than any of the ones Microsoft achieved in the 90s. Um, and, um, and we are, um, it's, it's much more robust, it's much more impregnable, their network effects, et cetera, et cetera, will be much harder for anyone to come along. Um, I mean, the government will come after you so quickly. Uh, and so that's the speech that cannot be given. And so um, at a place like Google, um, uh, I, I believe you have the top five or 10 people more or less understand this. They understand you can never talk about this. 
Um, and one of the sort of uh, things that I think is problematic about it is that then the other 30,000 people at Google have no idea about how the business works or why it works or what really matters. And they think it's the free sushi or it's the, the massages or um, it's the way all the uh, employees are treated really well. And I think it's good to do this. It's good to treat employees well. It's good to pay them uh, above market wages. But you can only do this when you're doing something that's very differentiated. You know, in business, money is either an important thing or it is everything. It is everything when you are competing like crazy. If you're running a restaurant, it's everything. You have no margin for being a conscious capitalist, for morality, <laughs> for doing anything else, because everything has to, has to be about cutting corners in every way. You get grandma at the cash register, you get the kids to wash the dishes below minimum wage in the back. In the back. That's how you run a Chinese restaurant, you know, or, or any of these sorts of places. Uh, and they're not very moral places. Google you know, has this somewhat uh, dopey slogan, don't be evil. But it's, it's genuine, it's authentic. And, uh, you know, and, and John has all sorts of new age things that he says about Whole Foods. And they're also, they sound a little bit flaky, but they're all very authentic. They're all authentic as well. And, um, but, but we need to make sure that we don't get our, um, our causation backwards. You get to have new age slogans. You can say you don't be evil. You get to do th these things if you were strategically wise in going into a business where you didn't have crazed competition um, one after the other. Now, last, uh, last note, you know, I know that uh, uh, it's often framed in terms of creative destruction and things like this, but I don't think that's actually what you want to be doing. We should, we should always stress creation over destruction. Um, you, there are lots of businesses you can do where you, you aim to destroy people. Napster set out to destroy the music industry. It, it, succeed, it actually succeeded at doing that. You know, you nap some music, you nap a kid. It's kind of a, it, so, it sounds kind of sinister. Um, that's not what you want to be doing in business. You want to be creating new things. Um, and uh, when you do that, maybe there's some incidental competition that happens. Maybe there's some old businesses that fall by the wayside. But it's not a zero-sum game. It's time now. And so, uh, and in a dynamic world, um, don't always have to narrowly compete. Uh, feel free to do some new things, some very different things, so different that you're in a class of your own. Thank you very much. Don't worry about it. Uh, mighty wizard behind the curtain, could you bring my slides back up? There we go. Uh, first of all, uh, for the record, Whole Foods Market is not a monopoly. <laughs> and it's not just stupid people that go into the grocery business. I thought that was a pretty arrogant statement. Uh, clearly, he's never had to compete with Walmart. Uh, I mean, in fact, we have Kroger. Uh, Whole Foods Market has so much competition, our same store sales have been steadily going down. It's never been more competitive for us as right now. There's, we don't have a monopoly on organic food. We don't have a monopoly on natural food. We don't have a monopoly on anything. We have just some competitive advantages. We were first mover. We got out there in front of everybody. But uh, you will make a good witness for the government someday, Peter. I, I... <laughs> Let's talk about the importance of competition. So competitive markets are the key to economic progress. And that's why capitalism is so much more dynamic than socialism. Because competition forces companies not to be lazy, not to be complacent. It forces them to innovate, improve, reduce cost, and evolve. And without this vigorous competition, there's just a tendency to be satisfied and lazy. You get kind of the bureaucratic mindset. We all see that in government monopolies, right? People that don't care about us, why should they? There's no competition forcing them to care. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. This is the opposite of innovation. Peter says in his book a couple of things. Monopoly is the condition of every successful business, and competition means no profits for anyone. Really. What about Starbucks? Starbucks is a highly competitive commodity business. They're selling coffee, for God's sake. Coffee's everywhere. Every restaurant sells coffee. There's thousands and tens of thousands of, of restaurants and, and coffee shops in the country. Uh, they have, don't have a monopoly, and they also sell it for high prices. And yet, Starbucks made over $2 billion in profits last year, more than so-called monopolies like Facebook, Amazon, Twitter, Tesla, Salesforce, and Box combined. So competition doesn't mean no profits. Clearly, Starbucks contradicts that thesis. He says, Peter says, capitalism and competition are opposites. 
Hardly. He's making a straw man argument against competition, arguing that in perfect competition there are no profits. But there's never perfect competition because there are always various competitive advantages that lead to higher profits. And capitalism is all about creative destruction of evolving business models to better meet customers' needs and desires. He used an example of restaurants. Don't open a restaurant because you, it's so competitive you'll never make any money. Really, I mean, McDonald's is a hugely successful corporation. They're a restaurant corporation. Been to Chipotle lately? Those guys are rocking and rolling. And I've already established Whole Foods is not a monopoly, I think, but we're operating some of the highest volume restaurants in the United States. It's a very, very competitive business, but you can make a lot of money in competitive business like restaurants. Peter talks in his book about the last mover disadvantage, uh, or he talks about the last mover advantage. I'm going to argue that that's actually a disadvantage. Most of the time, it's generally the first movers, the entrepreneurs, who develop economies of scale, have the innovations, and build the strong brands. Occasionally, somebody else comes in later and preempts the market. But in fact, there's never a last mover because competition never stops. It's relentless. It never ceases. And as a result, innovation continues. It is competition that drives capitalism. It's competition that helps our economy and our world to advance. So let me conclude. Thiel is misusing the word monopoly when what he's really saying is that sustainable competitive advantages are the key to business success. Monopoly is pejorative, and it's used by the critics and enemies of business to regulate and control it. True monopolies are not found in competitive free markets. They are found when government uses its coercive power to restrict competition. <laughs> Never-ending competition is at the essence of success in capitalism. That results in continuous innovation through the process of creative destruction. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now, while you're lining up for your questions, we have 10 minutes left. Before the questions start, I want to have the final poll based on their presentations, not on the Q&A. And uh, since we have difficulty seeing hands, let's do the decibel method. How many believe that Peter Thiel won the argument competition is overrated in America? How many? And how many favor John Mackey's response? I'd say John Mackey won. So now we're ready for our first questioner. Um, so John is using sort of the historical definition for monopoly, which I prefer. Um, Peter's using the economics definition of perfect competition. And I think that's part of the debate here that's confusing because you're not using the same definition. Um, but my question is this. If we look at it from perfect competition point of view, are more people working in perfect competition in Singapore as a percentage or in India? Take it. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I would suspect it's India. I don't have the I don't have the I don't have the I don't have the numbers, but I think it's uh, I, th I think that uh, I think it's it's always a question for each of us. Um, as we start our careers, as we focus on, biz on business or whatever we do in life, is you don't want to aim at perfect competition. If there's an area that's perfectly competitive, small restaurants are, big restaurants get to brand and economies of scale, so they're very different. But uh, you, you, want to, you want to do things where it's uh, not perfectly comp competitive. That's where you can make a big difference. I, I agree with that. I mean, we're always striving to create advantages in the marketplace uh, that, that won't be easily copied or, or uh, leapfrogged by our competitors. But I have a little bit different attitude about competition than Peter does, which is that I, I mean, I didn't like the competition when I was a kid growing up and whatnot, but as I've become an adult, I've realized that competition helps me to improve. Competition, you can view it as your ally, because they see things that you don't see, and they do innovations that you couldn't anticipate, and that helps us to get better. And I think if you adjust your attitude to seeing com competition as kind of your friend and you're working together to improve, and uh, I think that's a healthy way to do it. It's not just this cutthroat zero-sum game of kill or be killed. I, I think it's always, I always find it uh, that when, um, 
that when I'm too focused on the competition, um, that I stop thinking for myself. I'm focused too much on what are the moves the other person's making, how do I match those moves, how do I get better at some, some very incremental thing. And, uh, and when I've looked at the things that have worked and things that haven't worked that I've been involved in over the last uh, 20, 25 years of my life, it's, uh, it's when I've thought of competition as a shortcut to innovation. When I think, okay, I just need to look at what other people are doing and get some ideas from that and then improve. That's when I stop thinking for myself uh, and that's why I always think you want to go with these somewhat contrarian questions. What bi great business is nobody building? Um, you know, what great nonprofit is nobody funding? Um, what great investment is nobody making? That's, that's how I don't compete. As a venture capitalist, there's you know, a lot of other VCs I'm theoretically competing with, but I'm always focused on how not to compete every single day. How do, what are the other people doing? And it's, it's main, the only reason to look at what other people are doing is to figure out what not to do. I, I agree with that. Next question. Okay. Mr. Beck, when you said about cutthroat competition, ruthless and all that, that's one of the criticism of, of, of liberals against capitalism. Too much cutthroat competition and stuff like that. Ruthless. Anyway, the cliche is consumer is king, customer is always right. Competition is not against each other. It is competition competing for the consumer. You are directing your business, your product to them. Not against yourselves. All right. What's your, what's your question? Well, are you, are you missing the consumers? Yes. I'm a grocer. I listen to the customers or we don't have yeah. any business. Since I don't have a monopoly, I have no choice but to do that. Uh, <laughs> Ma'am, but you're next. Phil, Mr. Um, this question is directed at you. This uh, particular conference, there has been the theme of Operation Choke Point. Um, as the former CEO of PayPal, PayPal's services uh, just banned the, uh, the uh, transaction of firearms, of buying and selling. And uh, we'd like to get your thoughts on that. I mean, other uh, legal uh, transactions also include uh, you know, porn, uh, pres prescription drugs, et cetera, et cetera. But I'd like to get your thoughts on the uh, transaction or the legal transaction of firearms th that are not allowed on uh, PayPal. Well, I'm not involved in the business anymore, I so uh, uh, no, I, I, I wouldn't, uh, I, it wouldn't be doing that if I was still running it. Next. My question for both of you, is this really a debate about monopoly, or is this a debate about surrendering to the forces of political correctness by cowering before their use of the language? Good. Well, that's that. That was that. That, that, that was my that was my argument. That, uh, that you know the language does matter a lot, and um, and it's even though we always cower and we want to change the language so that uh, we can sort of get these tactical victories or we don't suffer tactical defeats. Pedagogically, it's important to think clearly about this. And uh, and if you're advising a young person to start a business and you tell them that the, the key to success is to outcompete the other person by doing the same thing. That is bad advice. That's immoral advice to give people because you are, um, you're not really getting them to do something where they can be far more successful if they, if they do something uh, nobody else is doing. And so, uh, so I, I, um, um, I, I, look, I understand we live in a society where the government's monitoring us the whole time and, uh, and we have to be careful what language we use, but, uh, but pedagogically, um, uh, it's important for us to be clear, and, and, uh, and you want to aim as close to monopoly. Maybe it's never possible in a, in a uh, dynamic world. It's never permanent or anything like that, but you want to always aim for that if you're, uh, if you're uh, starting a company. Yeah, I, I just think language is important, and I, I, I see how it's used by um, our enemies in ways that harm business and harm capitalism. So I, I don't think we can redeem the word monopoly uh, I know how Peter's using it. As I said, I think what he means by monopoly is having strong competitive advantages. I think that's a far better way for us to uh, market business uh, success in the marketplace. We have, we have three minutes left. Time for a couple of more I'm, questions. I'm a big fan of John's. Um, however, uh, my father was head of neighborhood pharmacy. And, um, and he worked from 9 o'clock in the morning to 9 o'clock at night and then delivered prescriptions afterwards till 10, 10.30 at night every day of the week, except Sundays till two, right? So um, then Walgreens came about, and uh, he was put out of business. Um, my question is, um, doesn't price po pricing power dictate um, 
the, the question whether something is a monopoly or not, like Walmart, if you have more, you have more pricing advantages. I mean, I mean, I'm sorry, I don't wish to be disrespectful to your father, but he wasn't put out of business. Walgreens did not put your father out of business. The customers voted him out of business because, because Walgreens had apparently a better selection, lower prices, and that's how we make progress in society. That's the destructive part of creative destruction. And otherwise, should your father have a monopoly on the drugstore business just because he's working hard in this town? I would say he shouldn't. It's the question of negotiating for better pricing on, on, on drugs and other, other things. That when you have a larger corporation and you have more, you obviously have a better negotiating standpoint than the smaller. Yeah, company. and obviously, obviously you, um, if you, 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 it's generally not the case that you want to be a small business up against a big business where you're undifferentiated, where the only variable is price. And this is, I think, another way to reframe our debate. Um, is the only variable is the only variable price? If it is price, then it's all about competition, competitive advantage, finding new things to do. If the if the relevant variable is quality, or um, doing something different, um, then uh, that's a very uh, different kind of thing. And so when we stress too much competition, it means we're only focused on um, on prices, and we assume everything's the same. This is, you know, we're back in Soviet Union territory, where it's a, it's a, how many tons of steel you're producing. Uh, and what I think matters much more is quality, and quality differentiation is another way that you can avoid uh, the sort of uh, uh, crazed direct head-on yeah. competition I, that never works. I, I, I quick, I, very quickly, I completely agree with that. I mean, I, I mean, Whole Foods Market's whole strategy is not to be competing head-on with Walmart on the basis of price. Instead, we need to be differentiated. We have to have products they don't have. We have to have quality that surpasses them and better service and a better store experience. If Walmart can get us right in their sights, uh, we're dead. And I'm sorry to have to break off the last questions, but Mark Skousen has a special presentation. Will you come up here, Mark Skousen? Do you have your microphone on? Yes. Good. I think it's on, yes. Uh, every year we give the Leonard E. Reed, R-E-A-D, Book Award. You can see why we do it, because of the name. Leonard Reed was the founder of the a fee, Foundation for Economic Education. Last year we gave this award, read this book, to John Mackey for his book, Conscious Capitalism. And we are delighted to announce that this year we are giving the award to Peter Thiel for his book, Zero to One. So, Peter, if you will come forward to receive the Letter E. Read Book Award. We can take a picture here. Okay. So thank you very much. Thank you so much.